Padney Smola, Dean and Professor at the Delaware Law School of Widener University, and Professor Luciene Dalhi from Univar. This is the new session of the webinar Law in the Time of COVID-19. And tonight we're going to talk about free speech and the legal issues arising to, due to the pandemic. I had the satisfaction of meeting Professor Rodney Smola on one of his visits to Brazil. It's very good to see him in this webinar. And I also know Professor Luciene from my current city, Itajaí. It's always a pleasure to hear her. I would like to thank the two universities for this opportunity and also to thank Professor Marcelo Dantas for this invitation to moderate this webinar. In the early 90s, uh, Professor Marcelo was my English teacher. And so if my English isn't good enough, it's probably Professor Marcelo's fault. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all the audience. Uh, it's good to see some friends, some colleagues and students in the chat. We hope that during this webinar, uh, you ask questions that will be passed on to the professors. Now I'll introduce the two professors who present us with their knowledge today. And I'll ask for permission to present a short version of the curriculums, as both are very extensive. Professor Rodney Smola is Dean and Professor of Law at the Delaware Law School of Widener University. He's a naturally known scholar on matter relating to constitutional law, civil rights, freedom of speech, mass media, particularly matters relating to libel and privacy. He's the author of several books and articles. He's also a lawyer, remains an active litigator on a wide variety, variety of legal issues and has present oral argument in state and federal courts across the country, including the Supreme Court of the United States. Professor Luciene Dalhi is a bachelor in law from Universidad do Vale do Itajaí, master in medieval, medieval studies from Pontificia Universitat Antoniana, Antoniana, and PhD in Doutorado de Recerca in Civil Romanistic Law from Universidad del Estudio de Roma, La Sapienza. And her research and teachings interesting are constitutional law and history of law. As we see before, the subject of today's webinar is freedom of speech, especially in times of COVID-19 pandemic. We're going to start with Professor Rodney Smola. Professor, could you start by telling us your thoughts on the subject? Well, it's good to be with everybody. I want to tell you that you're watching me from inside my car, and my wife Anna is here too. We had a massive power outage about one hour ago in our part of Delaware, and we lost all of our internet and all of our power. So we got in our car and we drove to a local shopping center and we're parked outside a Lowe's Home Improvement store. Maybe you can see the garden. And we're able to jump on the Wi-Fi of the store from the parking lot. So if you saw the movie Parasite that won the Academy Award in the United States from South Korea, you remember how the South Korean family were, were experts at stealing the Wi-Fi signals of others. And so, we are actually on the low Wi-Fi system here. And to make us, us feel less guilty, when this is over, we're going to go into the store and buy something. <laughs> so let me tell you that it's been a tumultuous last two weeks in the United States. And I happened to see this morning that it's been a very stressful time in Brazil as well. Uh, one of the lead articles in the New York Times today talked about the state of constitutional democracy in Brazil, the stresses that come from many different sources, including the decision of the Supreme Court to allow certain investigations of the president to go forward, 
the concerns over fake news and disinformation in the political context, and even concerns that some worry about the possibility of military intervention, though the New York Times generally discounted that. So my heart was broken to see that. I, I We love your country and, and we, we share so much in common. And I'm hoping that Brazil endures through this very difficult period as we in the United States have been trying to do the same, particularly in the last two weeks. So when we organized this session, we thought we would be talking about free speech in light of the pandemic. And I do have some thoughts to share very quickly with you on that. But all of that has been overshadowed in the last two weeks by the murder of George Floyd, who had his funeral yesterday. And because the video of how four police officers in Minneapolis essentially appeared to murder a helpless African-American, one officer putting his knee on his neck until he died, our country has been in extraordinary tumult. And all across the United States, in almost every major city, including here in Delaware and in our neighbor city, Philadelphia, and then just short distance from where I am right now in Washington, massive, massive demonstrations like we have not seen in the United States in decades as people poured into the streets uh, angry, protesting the racism that led to this and calling for change. People of all races and, and all ages. And so this has been a real test of our American commitment to freedom of speech because all of this protest came in the midst of this pre-existing pandemic and the limits on crowds and the limits on uh, on gatherings. I will, I'll just share something quite brief and then I'll look forward to my colleague and then we can have some dialogue and questions. Until one month ago, I would say, until the middle of May, most of the debate in the United States over how to deal with the pandemic was debate within our society largely dealing with the best moves from a health perspective and how to balance the health measures and the public safety measures of social distancing and lockdowns against the impact on the economy and the shutdown of the economy. That was the debate that people had. And it was principally from a law point of view, a, a problem that involved only the executive branches of government. The major decisions were being done by the governors of the states, the governor of New York, the governor of California, the governor of Florida, mayors of big cities, the mayor of Philadelphia, the mayor of Chicago, the mayor of Los Angeles. There was a little participation by the legislative branch, but not much. For the most part, these were executive decisions made by these, ex these regional executives. Of course, there was also the guidance and the, and the sort of national advice being given by the president, President Trump, and the people at the federal level that were advising the president. But, but my point is that for the most part, courts were not involved and lawyers were not involved. We were impacted by it and we were asked for advice, but, but it wasn't something that we thought about in, in judicial terms. This began to change about four weeks ago. And interestingly, just as some places in the United States were beginning to reopen, with, there was suddenly also a surge of lawsuits uh, filed almost in every jurisdiction in the United States, in which people were beginning to argue that the restrictions violated various constitutional rights, the right to travel, the right to gather and assemble, 
the right to protest, and very often the right to worship. And many of the lawsuits were initiated by churches and religious groups and lawyers that represent religious groups arguing that the restrictions on worship violated both free speech rights and freedom of religion rights. And these suits were filed on an emergency basis and a surprising number of decisions were rendered in the United States in the last two weeks, including one important decision from the United States Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court decision is a good example of both the freedom of religion and the freedom of speech debate. And I'll just describe it briefly, and then my introductory remarks will be over. The U.S. Supreme Court case came out of California. The lawsuit was brought by a church in California claiming that the restrictions on gatherings as they applied to people coming together to worship violated the First Amendment, particularly the freedom of religion in the First Amendment. And the restrictions were common, the same sort of restrictions I'm sure you you have in Brazil and restrictions that exist throughout the United States restrictions on the number of people that could be in one building at a time, often very low, 25, for example, restrictions on how far apart people could be, and then restrictions that had a particular impact on religion because of some of the rituals of religions. So some of the restrictions prevented certain brands, uh, certain parts of Judaism from existing because the particular Jewish Um, A ritual required a larger number, a number of 13, for example. And in Christian traditions, obviously, uh, bread and wine are part of Christian communion for Catholics and many other Christian groups, and that was not permitted. There were restrictions on singing, because singing is a particularly dangerous thing to do, because we We put more droplets into the air when we sing, and it can cause the transmission of the disease. And the the arguments that were made in the U.S., sometimes framed as free speech arguments, sometimes framed as religion arguments, were that the restrictions discriminated against gatherings for the purpose of either speaking or worshiping. And people said, well, why should you be able to go buy liquor? Why should you be able to go to a grocery store? Why should you in some places be able to go to a gun store and buy a gun? Why were these other activities deemed essential? More recently, getting a haircut or going to to a nail salon. Why were those activities allowed but not intellectual activity activities that that nourished the spirit and very interestingly when the one of these cases reached the united states supreme court the u.s supreme court decided not to issue an emergency order against the enforcement of the california restrictions it was a close case five to four the four most conservative justices on the court did want to intervene and did believe that California's rules perhaps violated the First Amendment. The four more liberal justices did not want to intervene. They wanted to defer to the decisions of the executive branches on these difficult, difficult health and safety issues. The interesting tie vote that that caused the case to go in favor of California and against the claimants was by the Chief Justice of the United States, John Roberts, who is typically more conservative, but in this case he joined the liberals. And the debate turned on this question. It turned on whether we should understand these rules as targeting speech and religion, 
in which case in the United States, we would be very tempted to say they violate freedom of speech and violate freedom of religion, or whether we should treat them as neutral. And even though they may have a strong impact on expressive activity, that just happens to be because of the accident of the fact that a lot of expressive activity, particularly religious worship, is done in large groups. So the chief justice said, I do not think this targets religion, nor did he think it targeted other kinds of speech activity. He said it just happens that large gatherings are places where traditionally we exercise our free speech, our freedom of worship, and those were treated the same. So he said there is a big difference between going to a theater, which we have shut down, going to a sporting event, which we have shut down, going to a concert, which we have shut down, or going to church, which we have shut down, because those are large gatherings where people usually sit right next to each other and are, have expressive activity of the kind that's very dangerous. That's very different from going to a liquor store. We have our liquor stores open here in Delaware, where you go in one at a time, there's no more than four or five people in the store, they're staying far away, they're wearing masks. He said there are different risks, and since there are different risk levels, the free speech issues come out the same. Last point I'll make, and then I'll be quiet. When the protests erupted over George Floyd, in most American cities, it was still not permissible to gather indoors or outdoors in small groups, I mean in large groups. All of that got tossed away in the protests and most, most officials did not try to break up the groups. They realized the anger was so intense, the need for people to express themselves was so important that as long as the groups were reasonably peaceful, they let the protests run even though technically they were violating the pandemic orders. My own daughter participated in one of the large marches in Washington, D.C. She did wear her mask. She and her boyfriend wore their mask. They did try to stay six feet from people, but they sent us videos and she was in these crowds of thousands of people by the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Mall and the Capitol more or less social distancing, but obviously not not really, not that effectively. And I, I think for the most part, the wise leaders let the protests take place. They tried to prevent violence. They tried to in, uh, enforce curfews as they got later at night, but they let them place, take place. Obviously one of the ugliest incidents we had was when the president of the United States ordered certain federal agencies to quite violently break up what appeared to be a peaceful protest in Lafayette Square outside the White House so the president could make a what appeared to be a kind of political appearance, a, 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 uh, a uh, photo opportunity with a Bible in front of St. John's Church, which is right across the street from the White House. In any event, I think those are good enough opening remarks for me, and I'll look forward to hearing from my colleague. Thank you, Professor Rodney Smaller. Uh, now we are listening then to Professor Luciane Dalry. Could you give us your thoughts on the subject? Yeah, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Professor Smaller. It's a pleasure to hurt you. Professor Dantas and Professor Salis, good evening. Good evening, Luis, I know that you are there. I am really glad to be part of this great event. Thank you for the invitation. I will talk about some aspects of Brazilian constitutional law during the COVID health emergency with an approach to fundamental rights and free speech. To understand the current context in Brazil, so Brazil is a federation and during the month of February, the Brazilian federal government declared a public health emergency. 
And in the following days, Brazilian Parliament approved a COVID health emergency law that we call COVID law. And the federal constitution and the COVID law provide the common action of a federal government, state governments, and local government for health protection. In March, federal government, state governments, and the local governments declared public calamity because they were and they are yet unable to provide the health care access to all in need. Health care access to all in need? Yes, because health is a fundamental right in Brazil. Our federal constitution recognized the health care access to everyone, national or foreigner, regular or irregular foreigner. To avoid the spread of the disease and the huge demand of health care access, government recommended social distance, hand hygiene and masks in situations involving displacement or public space. But it is an orientation. Although some irregular local decrees provide it as mandatory. Real restrictions to fundamental rights in pandemic contexts are provided by the COVID law that allows federal, state and local authorities power to impose isolation of infected people, quarantine of suspects of infection, mandatory exams or medical treatments, border restrictions, transport restrictions between cities and the states and other mandatory measures. And after the COVID law, a set of state and local acts was launched in an uncoordinated way and often without observance of the federal constitution and the parameters of COVID law. It means that some statutes have been restricting fundamental rights, interrupting public services and essential activities, ending up in losses for the population directly affected. It was a chaos. Now, in Brazil, 23 states declared quarantine in now their territory. Although quarantine is a measure to suspect of infection. In this sense, we are all suspected of carrying on coronavirus. And it is exposing the intrinsic danger of our bodies and their inherent vulnerability. So we are aggressors and victims in potential. Our bodies are inherently dangerous. And this, this is an unknown premise of emergency law. So all these fundamental rights restrictions ending up to discipline our bodies, changing values and creating new habits during the pandemia and against the pandemia. Putting this aside, in front of the context of this context of restrictions imposed to fundamental rights, we can point out that, as, that these rights are not absolute in Brazil. Brazilian legal system, Brazilian legal system, follows the European and the mainly German model where fundamental rights have restrictions. Free speech, for example, free speech is a right with 200 years of constitutional tradition in Brazil. It was violated, of course, under the years of dictature, but this right is confirmed in our current constitution. Freedom of speech and the freedom of press have no censorship in Brazil, but they have limits. Free speech has limits as the prohibition of anonymity and the discrimination, as well the right of reply and the civil and criminal liability. And they can be subject to subsequent legal restrictions. Limits that point out crimes as racism, slander, defamation and injury. The purpose of these limits is to safeguard 
equally relevant values, such as the right to honor and privacy. The specific rules about COVID emergency ensures creation, expression, and information rights, respecting constitutional limits. They ensure that the full exercise of the press is essential in providing information and giving publicity about the acts practiced by the state. In another approach, the COVID law provides protection measures and access to consolidate coronavirus information. Therefore, the federal public policies seem to be going in a different direction. The federal government was changing the way of reporting the cases and the death uh, of infected people and stopped releasing its total number of coronavirus cases and death in Brazil. So the government was violating the law and it's dangerous because it, it can be interpreted as president responsibly crime. Therefore, last Monday, our constitutional court imposed the publication of our coronavirus data in Brazil, and now the consolidated data information is being released to the public. Okay, but now let's talk about freedom of assembly, freedom of manifestation, and freedom of religion that Professor Smola talked a little bit. This right is, uh, these rights, they are restricted uh, to state and local decrees based on health emergency. These decrees usually prohibit the agglomeration and the permanence of people in public space such as parks, squares, beaches, and in some decrees, churches and temples. In the state of Santa Catarina, where I am living, the exception is for religious celebrations and activities, but with limitations. They cannot have participants at risk groups and must follow a hygiene protocol with social distance and other measures. These state and local decrees have been confirmed by the judiciary with the prohibition of caravans, meetings and street demonstrations aiming to safeguard public health. Even with these limits, we are in front of a new situation about the freedom of manifestation, for example, or the freedom of speech. And it is about the internet and pandemia. It is the fake news. Fake news are so important because they can arm prevention work and create damage to people's health. The manipulation of partial exposure of facts or the poor and simple lie has always been very present in our lives, to the point that we have penal classification for such acts, slander, defamation, injury, even though we do not have specific legislation to this information on social media. Spreading this information and the misinformation about coronavirus, coronavirus although not a criminal offense, has very serious repercussions, endangering public health and directly affecting people's lives. It puts people at risk by promoting misleading information treatments as false coronavirus cures, tests and vaccines and promoting a false sense of security. So, what to do when the fake news spreading disinformation and misinformation damaging people's health? The best thing I can say is that there is a law project about fake news on social media in our Congress in Brazil. And its focus is in imposed duties of surveillance to internet providers. Even without a better legal answer, and I am so sorry about this, 
we have observed that social media giants have started to restrict free speech through internal policies, expressing concern about the misinformation that can damage people's health. For example, Facebook and Twitter are deleting posts that oppose the recommendations of health authorities. They deleted recent videos or posts from the Brazilian president in which he refused to comply with social distancing measures and promote improved drugs to treat the virus. This is our Brazilian contest and it, I am so sorry about this. But I would like to know how U.S. deal with fake news in social media in time of COVID. Please, Professor Zmola. I think our I think our system is identical to Brazil, basically. So we have we have no legal recourse generally if if a if a website let's say wants to promote a false cure for COVID or make the claim that people should throw off their masks and get together because the virus really is not dangerous or, or anything that is disinformation that damages public health. There's no private remedy available. It's not it's in, in, the, in the American context, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be liable. It wouldn't be defamation in which there was someone who could bring bring a case. In theory, if it was real medical advice and the medical advice was false advice, then our public health authorities, the, the Food and Drug Administration uh, or the Federal Trade could, could try to shut it down as a kind of false advertising. I don't know that anybody has done that. So the it, it comes down, I think, to exactly the same situation. The key decision makers are the social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, and so on. And that that is a very that's a very difficult legal and public policy question because on the one hand you could make the argument since the large social media platforms effectively function as our public squares that's where that's where all the expression comes from maybe we don't want facebook and twitter deciding whose speech gets out there and whose speech doesn't get out there. And we don't want them discriminating against even crazy websites because we generally want to preserve freedom of speech. That's one side of it. The opposite side of it is if they don't do it, who's going to do it? The government does not have the power uh, to order the takedowns on Facebook. And maybe we want those large platforms to police uh, disinformation, particularly in a time of a crisis like this where it's very dangerous. And exactly like you have described, Twitter moved against President Trump because t Twitter took the view he was an enemy of, 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 of public health by making all sorts of wild claims about what would work and what wouldn't work and, and seeming to encourage people to take the law into their own hands and violate the social distancing mandates of local governments. And so we had the, the almost crazy uh, situation in which a large social media platform was essentially censoring our president because it thought our president was a threat to public safety, quite parallel to what you've just described in Brazil. This, of course, then led the president to begin to take legal actions against Twitter and Facebook and social media. So it's 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 a circus atmosphere almost. Okay, Professor Luciani, you'd like to say anything else about the subject? Not hearing you. Sorry, sorry. Okay. About privacy. Uh, in Brazil, we have uh, a federal policy about privacy and 
the coronavirus data. For example, if I have coronavirus, uh, I will be a number in the statistic, but uh, no one will, will know that I, I have coronavirus. United States, this kind of data, it is public or there are some politics about anonymity and secrecy or things like this. Yeah, I don't think we are as sophisticated as Brazil in protecting privacy in that regard. And so, for example, uh, although I suppose if an individual gets it and it's a private medical record, it might be difficult to get access to that. For the most part, just about everybody finds out if, if a person tests positive. And I, I'd say that that's almost become a kind of cultural norm. So, for example, at our university, if, if I test positive as the dean of the law school, or one of my faculty members does, or one of the students does, we are expected to report it to the university. The university may or may not release that more generally, but they often will effectively disclose, maybe not the name, but often it just everybody can figure it out because they want to warn the other people that were exposed to that person and so on. So I think I think my my best answer to you is there has not been a heavy emphasis on on privacy in that regard. The other interesting thing, and I think this is actually a positive, is that for the most part, well-known Americans who have tested positive have been very open about that. And so Tom Hanks is probably the most prominent example, but we've had other actors, journalists, political leaders, uh, Tim Kaine, who ran for vice president with Hillary Clinton. He's our senator from Virginia. He and his wife tested positive, immediately announced that. So there's a kind of a, of a cultural leadership quality that it's actually better to let people know, engage in the proper social distancing, and in many instances, carry on your job, even though you've got the disease. So I think maybe the most famous example of that is a CNN journalist, Chris Cuomo, whose brother is Andrew Cuomo, the, uh, the governor of New York. Um, the journalist, Chris Cuomo, got the COVID virus and, it, and was quite sick. I mean, he, re he really was hit pretty hard by it. So was his family. But he, brought, he continued to broadcast every night uh, on CNN, you may have seen some of them in Brazil, uh, from his basement to kind of be a role model and show people, I'm not dead just because I got it. I'm not dead. I can survive it. This is how I'm feeling. This is what's going on. It was, I think, a real, real good public education. So it's a little bit of a rambling answer. Sorry for the long answer. But that's sort of my sense as to where we are. Thank you, thank you, Professor. I think we still have some time. And while we, we wait for the questions, uh, would you like to make some additional considerations, Professor Luciani? Maybe some reflection on the conceptions of freedom of speech we have here in Brazil in comparison with that one that we have in Europe or anything else? Wow, wow, wow. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the Brazilian model, we are following the, the German model mainly. And uh, it's really, it makes sense because uh, we, we follow constitutional German model in general. So uh, for us, it is, it's, really, it's really normal. It's, it's a part of a system. Because uh, we are ex-colonies from uh, Portugal and after Portugal and uh, the rest of Europe, they are influenced by German constitutional law and uh, it's arriving. And uh, yeah, we are following this, uh, this path. So uh, I don't know if you have uh, some question in special. I, I just think it's really interesting, uh, just the privacy, because we, when we think about the United States, we think about uh, uh, a lot of liberties and uh, at the same time, a lot of uh, privacy. But 
we can see that there are a kind of uh, solidarity in this moment of uh, COVID more than an, uh, a concern about privacy. And here in Brazil, there is a concern about privacy. Our president is the first to say, I want my privacy and I don't want to share my tests, my exams about coronavirus or things like this. And uh, in here, we, we have the, this um, guarantee that uh, I will be a number, but uh, no one will know my name. I will not suffer discrimination or things like this because I had uh, or I have coronavirus. Even my colleagues at work, they will receive the, the information that someone have uh, or someone has the, this coronavirus, but not exactly the name of uh, the person. But uh, everyone that has the information must inform the government, the health minister, health minister to, to participate of this data and to have uh, a complex numbers, a consolidated number of uh, coronavirus. But this, Professor Salles, I don't know. Now it's with you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, let's wait for the questions from our um, audience. Uh, maybe I have a question to ask to Professor Rodney Smola. Uh, in the American Judicial Review, we have something that's called uh, facial challenges. Uh, what does it mean and are they used to, to protect the freedom of expression or of, of speech? So in the United States, a constitutional challenge can be brought in two ways. One is what you've just mentioned, a facial challenge. The other is called an as applied challenge. A facial challenge is an extreme challenge. It is, a, it is a claim that the law is absolutely unconstitutional and that there is no situation in which the law could ever be applied that would be constitutionally permissible. Or a slight variation of that, the overwhelming number of applications of the law would be unconstitutional. You might be able to imagine a tiny case here or there that where the law would be permissible, but it would be substantially overbroad. And courts do not like to entertain a facial challenge. They would prefer an as applied challenge, which is much easier to bring. And when you bring an as applied challenge, you're not saying that the law is unconstitutional in every single conceivable application. But you're saying on these particular facts, in this particular situation, the law is unconstitutional. So, for example, if there's a limit to gatherings of 50 people, that is inherently in tension with free speech values, with the right to assemble, with freedom of association, with freedom of religion. If I bring a facial challenge to that, I will probably lose because a court in the time of the COVID crisis will say, well, certainly there have got to be situations in which it would be permissible to restrict it to 50 people. And so we're not going to say the whole thing is gone because it's, it's got to be fact specific. We have to know the particular assembly that you're trying to do and why you claim in this particular situation, the 50 limit is, is impermissible. And sometimes those cases would win, sometimes those cases would, cases would lose. One of the things that I've suggested to people is that as we pull out of the pandemic and it appears that we get safer and safer, if the curve were to flatten or if there were to start to be vaccinations, then courts would be more inclined if governments were too slow to say, come on, you better lift, you better, you better start e easing up because you're now out of alignment with the medical reality. L last quick point, judges vary in their 
judgment on this. And I think one of the reasons in that earlier case I described that, that our chief justice sided with the government of California is that he is someone that has a very modest view, he will say, of the role of judges. He generally believes social policy should be set by elected officials and judges should be careful about when they intervene. And he would want to have a very clear cut case before he did intervene. Thank you, Professor. Um, we're still out of questions here. Professor Lucien, you have something to tell us about the subject, something else? Oh, we have some question here. Okay. Um, let's yeah. see. I was Good able evening. to see the question. Sorry. Can you see, Professor? I, I was able to see it, and I can repeat it. So I was asked okay. about President Trump's censorship of online communication. So this is a little bit of a complicated story. I'll try to I'll try to make it simple for you. In the 1990s, the federal government passed a law that communications lawyers like me call by its nickname. We call it Section 230. It has that name because that happens to be the number in the federal statute of the law. It's Section 230 of what we call the Communications Decency Act. It's a federal statute. It had an enormous impact on our society, even though until a couple of weeks ago, almost no Americans had ever heard of it, and very few lawyers knew of it. You had to be, you had to be a, an internet lawyer to know about it. But it is an enormously powerful law. It's almost as important as our free speech guarantee. Because Section 230 has been interpreted by American courts as absolutely immunizing internet service providers for the content of third parties that they post on the internet. So this is a complete reversal of our normal American rules. So just to, to illustrate, if I write a letter to the New York Times and the New York Times publishes the letter, the New York Times is treated as the publisher. So someone that is wrong, if I, if I defame someone, they can sue Rod Smola, but they can also sue the New York Times. But if I put that post on Facebook, they can sue Rod Smola still because I said it, but they cannot sue Facebook. Facebook, Google, Twitter are absolutely immune from liability for almost everything that appears on the internet, unless they say it themselves. But if they simply post it from somebody else, they can't be sued in an American court. My own view, this is my own private view, is that our American courts have misinterpreted Section 230. They have, they have made it a much broader immunity than our Congress ever intended. It's actually a narrower immunity than it has been given. So believe it or not, I'm actually sympathetic to the views of President Trump, and I'm not usually, but I am in this case, because I think our courts have gotten the law wrong. And I think that President Trump's executive order, which I guarantee you, he did not write. He has some very smart lawyers that wrote it for him, is actually on sound legal ground. Now, I'm going to finish my answer here. Even if the president is right legally, that Section 230 should be looked at again and maybe modified somewhat. So, for example, a simple modification would be, let's say someone posts something on Facebook that is an invasion of privacy, defames you. One of the big things we have now in the United States is what's called revenge porn, where someone breaks up with their lover, they break up with their spouse, and then they put pictures of that person naked on the on the internet 
one one simple way to modify the American rule would be to say once you notify Facebook or notify Twitter or notify Google that there's this offending material, they have a certain amount of time to investigate, and then they either keep it up or take it down. And if they keep it up, then they own it, and you, and you could sue them. That is, by the way, the way we already treat intellectual property. So that's how we treat a copyright violation on the Internet. We give copyright more protection than we give, than we give privacy. So I would actually like to see the law change a bit and, and, and be retracted somewhat. Um, what I don't like at all is that President Trump only did this because he was mad at Twitter. So it was just retaliatory. He was angry that they censored him, and so we attacked them, and that's why everybody rallied to Twitter's defense. But I'm probably in the in the minority among American scholars that thinks Section 230 is over the top and gives too much immunity to Facebook and Twitter and so on. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we have another question here from Professor Marcelo, and he asks, uh, do both professors believe anything will change concerning the right of free speech after the COVID-19 in Brazil and in the U.S.? Let's hear from Brazil first. <laughs> okay, thank you, Professor. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think things will change because uh, there are this movement of fake news and uh, the post-truth and this kind of movement, this kind of manifestation, they can really arm prevention and arm public health. And even the people, when they will talk about manifestation in the street with agglomeration and a lot of people together, at least here in Santa Catarina, people will rethink about the dangers and the new habits that we are uh, having in this moment of pandemic because I am not seeing here in Brazil the same thing that we saw in the United States, for example, about the flight case with a lot of manifestation, a lot of people hungry and in the street. I think uh, we will rethink this even because we have a uh, health care access that is uh, a little bit fragile. So we we are in this moment we are so uh, so concerned about this so yes i think it will it will change it will change in more than people uh, habits than than in law but i am waiting for the, uh, the law about fake news on uh, social media because i think it's necessary in this uh, in this time of fake news and uh, post true I don't know if uh, post two is the exact expression for these people that think, for example, that uh, the the planet it's uh, it's not um, uh, it's not um, how say it uh, it's not a ball it's like a, a table or things like this. Sorry about my English, but professor, it's with you now. <laughs> well, I think I think we probably. Did, um, of course, our habits will change, or, or it will be quite a long time before we're back to the old way of doing things. Here's my, here's my th I think, closing thought. As lawyers and judges, we think the law is everything, and we think the law has the ability to control human behavior. But I think one of the things we learn from events like this is, particularly in the world of, of the Internet, Law is always playing catch up. It can't can't entirely keep up. Yeah, and yeah, no matter what you try to do about fake news, it will find a way. It's kind of like Jurassic Park. You know how the dinosaurs found a way? Nature finds a way. It will find a way. And it's very, very difficult, except at the margins, to exert too much social control over what people say in social media. Okay. Uh, there is a, a notice that the Congress is shaping a data privacy law during the pandemic in the U.S. Uh, would that be an open door for actually regulate this matter? 
Yeah, I think I think the the, the decision of President Trump to call into question the law that I talked about, that was already beginning to bother a lot of people in Congress. I think there will be some reforms, and these incidents may trigger it some, but the, the U.S. Congress moves very slowly, and right now we still have a divided Congress. We have a Republican Senate, a Republican White House, and a Democratic House of Representatives. The idea that much will get done until there's another election, I think, is is, is, is unlikely. So my guess is it, it, it will take longer than most folks think. Okay. Let's see if we have any more questions here. Professor Gilson Jacobsen uh, is congratulating both professors for their speech. And he asks, why in extreme, extreme times like the one we are living through, are the constitutions so disrespected? Shouldn't it be just the opposite? Shouldn't government officials, starting with them, be the first to abide or observe the constitution? So, so I don't mind jumping in. I think that, that generally in the United States, our public officials have been sensitive to our constitutional rights. But it's the notion that even precious constitutional rights sometimes have to give way to an emergency, to, to disasters like this. And and Abraham Lincoln, you know, once said, do you preserve all the rights but one? Three together. So uh, I, I, I think that the sense that exists in the United States, I am guessing it exists in Brazil, is that a lot of these emergency measures are temporary. That, that they're things we have to do for a while until we see a vaccine invented or we see the spread of the virus reduced. It's, it's not like we're suddenly giving up freedom of religion forever or freedom of speech forever. We still have it. It's just digital more than it is live. And that, that feeling that the, this time will pass makes it easier to accept that it may not be a violation of the Constitution to temporarily suspend matters to preserve public health. Professor Luciani? So I, I agree with uh, Professor uh, Jacobson. And I think the uh, Constitution is our better way to keep our democracy, our constitutional democracy, our uh, rule of, the, of law. And um, I am so sorry that we have government officials really, really disobeying the constitution. And we, we are seeing things uh, unexpected uh, from 10 years ago or things like this. But um, yeah, it's really sad and the people must be people must be vigilant be surveillance because uh, this is so important and even like this i think we will not have a dictature but yes we need to be to take care about this situation because uh, it, it, it's uh, it's it's dangerous and we are seeing the executive power uh, more and more uh, powerful, and um, it's really dangerous. And um, so, I'm, I'm so sorry. We must, uh, we must keep our our surveillance uh, in the acts of the state. Thank you, Professor. I think we are reaching the time limit. It's like uh, one hour of this webinar. I will ask professors if you like to do some final considerations about the subject. I'm good. I, it's been a delight. It's been wonderful to be with you. I think we have a lot of agreement. Basically everything. And on that last point, I agree the Constitution is important. I was only suggesting, at least in the American position, some of what we've done we probably don't think does violate the Constitution. A little nuance. 
I'm not sure it's quite the same in Brazil. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much about the invitation, for the invitation. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure to be here with you. And uh, yeah, I am fine. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks anyone for the audience. It's, bye bye. it's a pleasure to hear both professors, learn with both professors. And everyone is invited to watch the next webinar se uh, session um, next week. Thanks for the audience. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.